Hello. 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 How are you? I'm pretty good. I'm still fighting with console. Oh. <laughs> well, yeah. yeah. <laughs> I don't think it, yeah, I don't recall it being the easiest piece of software to use in the world, so. Well, I, I read that it's easier than the other ones. Well, <laughs> I don't know what that means. That could be that the yeah, we're starting. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Hello. Hello, Krishna. How are you? Yeah, I'm fine. Right. Good. All right. So, welcome to the meeting. Uh, I've got a bunch of things to talk about. I, I thought I'd go through some graph neural network stuff that I found. Uh, I think that might help people. Uh, if you're watching online or you're watching in the meeting, it should clarify some things for you if you have questions. I also put some things in the Slack channel on, on graph neural networks. There was a nice primer. I think I have that today. Uh, it's one of the okay. things. So it's, it's nice because it's great. You know, it's like they, I think they drew out some graphics. Hi, Dick. Um, also, we're still working on that special issue uh, that I, you know, we're going to be contacting people and getting them on board uh, in, over the next several weeks. Um, then we have some things on uh, soft materials. And I don't know if Karan will join us, but we were having a discussion on axolotl transcriptomes a while back, a couple weeks ago. So I wanted to bring up some information on that. And because he wanted to put like transcriptomic data on top of microscopy data. And I told him that that's very hard to do, but more importantly, I have to look for the right data set. And so I don't think, I didn't see any spatial transcriptomics on axolotl, but they do have a lot on the embryo. So um, that might be interesting as well. So first, yeah. yeah. I also know there's a uh, lecture on um, genomics and uh, knotting and how it, how uh, I guess the genome folds into the nucleus. Yeah. Um, on at the conference at APS in Chicago, the, I don't know, they're having a conference there. Yeah. Oh, right now? Um, next week, I believe. Oh. Signed up for it as a student, so I didn't have to pay very much. Yeah, well, that's pretty good. Well, because there was soft matter um, oh, yeah. lectures. That, that's the only reason I. What I'm not into the genomic modding part of this. Yeah, <laughs> limit my scope here. Yeah, well, I think it's like it tang you know it tangles up in the nucleus and it has to unravel and. They have to make sure yeah. it doesn't tangle up like as a, oh, there are different enzymes that ensure that doesn't tangle, but yeah. Yeah, and if it's a loop, then it doesn't tangle as much. Yeah. Like it, has, yeah, I think Richard can talk about that more. Yeah. More than I, I can. Wait, oh, if what's a loop? You the genome? The, um. The chromosome. Yeah, I mean, our DNA yeah. is a loop. Our DNA is a loop. It's, not a, loop. it's oh. not a straight uh, open ended thing. When was that shown that the DNA is loop? No, no, it didn't show it. I, I said, you think it's a loop, but you don't think it's no, a loop. No, 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 you're, you're being over, oversimplified. Uh, yeah. Uh, <laughs> you uh, said, you Andy, say. you, did you meet Andy Maniacs when he was in our lab? You did? Susan? I can't hear you, Susan. Yeah, yeah, I know you can't hear me. Uh, I have uh, stuff going on in the background here. Yeah. I think might be coming through. I'm not sure. Um, no, don't hear it. Don't hear uh, you're it. Oh, great. This this microphone is pretty good. Um, yes, I met Andy Maniotis so when he came through. Okay, the, the hypothesis is not the DNA is in the loop but rather that there's a loop of DNA, which we call chromolinkers, which attaches all the chromosomes into it. Oh. And that came out of Andy Maniotis' work, which unfortunately he never finished. <laughs> okay, so uh, 
Uh, it's in our book, uh, Embryogenesis Explained, with all, all of the references and all of the uh, existing data, which is very sparse. Okay? If, if it is proven that the scrotal linker exists, it will be a revolution in genetics. Okay. 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 Uh, the ex you know, I tried some experiments. There, there was a Japanese one, one possible experiment is to make, do you know what a chromosome spread is? Um, yeah, they uh, okay. freeze, freeze the cell and then throw it at a plate and then it breaks it. Sorry, I don't know about the physics, but uh, <laughs> you, you throw cells at a plate, they bust open and the chromosomes disperse and that's called a chromosome spread. Spread. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. Uh, there's very little literature on the process itself. Okay, usually yeah, just shows the final it's result. A, it's a secret. <laughs> Not a secret. It has to be done right to get just the right impact. To it. But the, the, the thing that we tried to do, but uh, never succeeded at, is looking at chromosome spreads from the point of view of are the chromosomes arranged in a particular order, which might indicate they are connected to each other. Okay. Okay. There's a little bit of literature on that by a fellow named N-A-G-E-L-E, -E, uh, back from the 80s, I think, uh, where he suggested that there were particular orders uh, to the chromosomes. Uh, there's a Japanese group that made a, made a movie of chromosomes spreading and then threw it out. <laughs> <laughs> Yes. Work needs to be done. <laughs> right. So, so uh, I was hoping to analyze their movie, but they threw it away. <laughs> so you only get the stills that they published in their paper. Okay. Okay. So it's an interesting question, and of course the question is, you know, even if these exist, are they universal? So it should be done in a couple of disparate organisms. Uh, but uh, the, the field of making chromosome spreads is usually for humans, and it's usually for looking for genetic diseases. And the, the field is called cyto, uh, what was called? cytogenetics. Oh, okay. Okay. Uh, so they have little interest in the actual structure of chromosomes. <laughs> <laughs> they just they're just looking for aberration. Yeah. Okay. Uh, so that's where, now, we did a review of all, I said, all the literature, I think, in, it was about 2016 or something like that. And uh, so all the background literature is there. Uh, and uh, it'd be nice if somebody could follow it up. Uh, and maybe, Bradley, uh, yeah. maybe we can get some students to find chromosome spreads online and see if the order of the chromosomes holds up at all. Yeah. The problem. The problem is you're splatting them. You might break the chromolinker if it exists, because if, if it exists, it might be a single strand of DNA. Uh, but the order may or may not be preserved. Okay. okay. Uh, and if it's not preserved, it may be hit too hard. <laughs> if it is preserved, uh, then you have to prove that by having multiple cases. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> okay. But there may be many chromosome spreads online now. I don't know. I haven't, I haven't looked for them. Yeah. Okay. Thanks for telling me that. That it's, uh, at least somebody's still doing. Yeah. So, so if if the chromolinker exists, it indeed would be. Uh, it's reasonable in the sense that it would be synonymous with the, the ring of DNA that you find in uh, bacteria and, and most most bacteria and most archaea. They, they do have rings. The, the, okay. the whole genome is a ring, yeah. most of them. There are some exceptions, but uh, uh, so it would be interesting to know if eukaryotes also have a ring. Have a ring in there. Yeah. yeah. So you can see what I mean. It's a really fundamental question in terms of the organization of the genome. Okay? All right. Yeah. yeah. Well, they're so, having a, a talk on this at the conference at APS. I'll send I'll send you both the link or okay. uh, that'll be good. Okay, good.
Yeah. Uh, maybe uh, uh, a qu question for the two of you on the special issue. Yeah. Have you done? Have you two done the arm wrestling to see who's first editor? Um, I mean, I can be first editor. I don't. I didn't ask Susan, but um, <laughs> I'm just going to dive into the middle of this and try to pretend that. Okay. So I yeah. fix it. Look, my career is unaffected by whether I'm second or third. <laughs> That's good because I better be sandwiched in the middle and say I didn't do very much. Oh. You know, I did everything. You know, I, did everything. I didn't okay. do it. Okay, okay. Fine. Now we have an order. Yeah. Bradley, you and me. Okay, okay. fine. Yeah. Okay, so Bradley, uh, what I would suggest, did they, they ask for a reply within a week? Yeah. Within a week or something? Yeah. How about giving them uh, a tentative list in the sense that we're contacting those people? Right. Yeah, that's what I did. Okay. That, yeah. that would be the simple way to re keep them in, in the circle, in the, in the loop. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Sounds okay. good. Yeah. Thanks. Okay. Go ahead. Your agenda. Okay. <laughs> so that was great. Yeah. Thanks for the, uh, for that. And then, uh, so let's see, let me share my screen. Um. All right. Oh, stupid! Before we go on, a stupid question to Bradley. Uh, yeah. Any other people from Russia? Uh, I don't think so. I don't no, think we have had any, really. I mean. Okay, because Russia has announced they're shutting off their internet from the rest of the world on March 11th. Oh, wow. Okay, so I'm just going to say, get priority to communicating with anybody who is. Okay. Yeah. Don't worry about it. Okay. Okay. All right. Uh, so the first thing I wanted to talk about was the axolotl transcriptomes. Uh, I don't know if uh, uh, Karan is joining us later, but axolotl transcriptomes. So we, we talked about like taking some axolotl images and mapping on gene expression data, and that's called transcriptomics. So there are a number of different tools on, there are a lot of uh, kind of like atlases that people have created, but a lot of it is uh, like for specific genes, there are some maps for fate mapping, there are some other types of uh, atlases, but they're not really something that you can map spatially to the, um, to the embryo. So what you need is something like a spatial transcriptomics map, and it doesn't seem to exist for axolotl. They have them for other organisms, I believe, but not for axolotl. So this is a paper that um, is a manuscript, a tissue mapped axolotl de novo transcriptome enables identification of limb regeneration factors. And so this is an example of the type of data that they have for this um, type of work. And they have the sequence data here. So there's a de novo assembly for uh, Ambi uh, Ambiostoma mexicanum, which is uh, the uh, axolotl, the model organism axolotl. I don't know if there are any, how many species are in Ambiostoma, um, but that's the one that everyone uses for their um, their experiments and things like that. Uh, then there are these predicted protein sequences. Uh, then there are these functional annotations. So this is a functional annotation report. And let's see, oh, this doesn't, this goes down to the, this is a downloadable file. So we'll oh, be able Bradley, to explore. I think there is another species uh, called Tigrina. Okay. Oh, there's Quran. Okay, yeah. I don't know, yeah. <laughs> but that's the one that everyone uses for uh, experiments. Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. The X level is most widely in labs. Yeah. So then there are these expression matrices. So these are. Okay, can I, can I ask you a stupid question? Yeah. The group that organized this web page include Randall Boss, B O S S. Hmm, I don't see. It just says Bryant at all. It may be. I, I don't. Yeah, I don't know. Okay, good. Uh, I've spent a little bit of time in his lab, and uh, he's, he was very cooperative, and he was into uh, genomics of X levels. Oh, okay. Yeah. Maybe I'll look that up. Uh... He's, he's in Kentucky. All right. R A N D L boss U S S. Okay. 
Henry, he'd be a good person to look up and see if he's got some recent papers on this and whether it's involved in this group. Yeah. Yeah. So they have a number of di different matrices of isoforms and genes. So isoforms are different um, forms of a gene. They're like, uh, I think they're, I guess they're proteins or RNA that have different uh, sequences. They hit, take on different forms as they're, when they're in the uh, cytoplasm. So they can actually look at the different isoforms by their sequence. So they have some data on that, and then they have some data on genes, so the gene sequences. And then they have these interactive heat maps, which are for different stages in a map. Let's see. So this is run by the Broad Institute. So you can see that it's not really a map to the actual image. It's a map to different tissues. So you can see that they have these different genes here listed or these different loci that they sequence. And then they're able to get an expression level for each of these. So you can see that they have different numbers here when you go over it. And you have it for bone, uh, cartilage, ovary, testes, blood, blastoma, arm. Who, who's who's ovary? Um, <laughs> I think, I don't know. I don't know. They, I think they just take the tissues from the organism or from like some samples and they put them in here. Yeah, but I which, think, which organism? <laughs> I think they're all, I, no, I think they're all uh, axolotl. Okay. Yeah. I think they're axolotl. Oh, okay. And then what stage? Uh, I think these may be adult. I'm not really sure. It says blastoma enriched TMM, which is, uh, I'm not really sure what that is. But they have uh, basically, you know, they usually take the organism, uh, sample each part of the, each tissue, and then they look at these different genes and their expression. So it's not really specific to cells and it's not really specific to the embryo. But this is the way they usually do this type of study. They'll look across different tissue types and do like a, uh, an aggregate sample of the data. And then, you know, for each of these loci, so this is where you have these different uh, genes here that are identified in different, uh, so they're, you know, different types of genes associated with human and chick and mouse that come up you know if you probe for it you can get a, a result so some of these you know there's no data yeah that's like at a 0, 0.00 level some are a little bit higher um, and then there is this other set here tissue enriched axolotl transcripts so this is actually the tissue enriched i think this may have been a control um, and then this is the actual tissue enriched um, sample you'd have to go back to the paper to read the um the methods of how they did this so i'm not going to go through those methods right now i'm just trying to give people a feel for the data and then you get these expression values here so you, again you have the same i think it's the same set of genes um and then you have these different sites um and in different places in the body so there are these different tissue types that are sampled and you get a, a value and you you know you can do analyses like you know take the difference from one data set to another or you can map them to some of these tissues and so i mean there's nothing really for the embryo is my point but this is the closest you're going to get and this is the way the data looks so for the most part you're going to get this kind of data where you can go across different tissues um other than that you know there's there, there are some, you know, there are a lot of papers where they have like next gen generation sequencing, which is where you get the, the genome, plus you also get, you know, you get the reads from the genome sequence, plus you also get the expression values for those reads. The reads are just sequences of DNA that they sample from different parts of the genome. And the ones that have high expression levels, then they map it to, uh, uh, you know, an original draft of the genome to see where it is in the genome. So what gene is it associated with and that sort of thing. Um, in terms of getting it onto a like some sort of atlas, it's it's a lot harder to do because you know you can't you don't have tissue you don't have cell specificity here. You just have tissue type specificity. And so even here, it's not necessarily going to tell you exactly what's being expressed at some point in development. 
So it's 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 kind of a hard problem to put all the data together. I know that um, I know it, you know it seems kind of easy to do these things, especially with genomic data, because you have to find the right data set for this, and then put stitch it together uh, with some other data set that involves microscopy. I don't know of any uh, study where they've actually done the time lapse, where they have the uh, embryo and they're following it through time and then they're getting like some sort of, um, you know, s fluorescent signal or something like that, or where they actually take different stages and they sacrifice them and get the uh, genomic data from that. So that's, that's, that's kind of the hard problem of this spatial transcriptomics. And, uh, you know, so there's, it, there's no, they do spatial transcriptomics on some organisms. They've done it, I think, in mouse and I think in C. elegans, um, where you have like the embryo uh, and you're localizing this gene expression signal to specific cells. The only way to do this in axolotl is to do like sort of a pseudo spatial transcriptomics where you put together like the different tissue types or you know, the different regions. I don't even think you get it for really early embryos given the data, but um, you know, it's gonna look a lot different than that, but. Well, I'm interested in their mosaic salamanders, the Randallwoth's mosaic salamanders. Yes. Yeah. Um, they turn out spotted, they're ax spotted axolotls, and uh, they usually grow with a um, defects in the, their spine. Okay. And, you know, just encephalopathies and curved spines and they're, um, anyways, uh, I don't know if they're um, producing them anymore, but they had a very interesting blastocele. And I wanted to look at that further to see if it really was a, um, a defect. Yeah. Yeah, I didn't, I didn't know if it was a defect or not, but uh, anyways, I wanted to, wanted to look at them, but uh, I get to do that after I do get my um, optical coherence elast elastography uh, going. Yeah. 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 <laughs> Everything in the right order. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so if, yeah, that sounds great. So if you're interested in uh, the sort of spatial transcriptomic stuff, like some of the stuff that people have done so far, they have papers on this. Uh, people have generated some atlases. It's it's almost always on adult animals, but there's some little bit on uh, embryos. But the embryos they aren't really mapped to different cells, so I can really show you a good example of that. Um, and then they just you know it's just a matter of mapping it to some region of the embryo or the organism. And the hypothesis is, is that different cells are expressed differentially in different tissues or in different areas of the organism. And that tells us something about, you know, its, its function. So, you know, some genes we, you know, we've struggled to, we, we know the sequences of a lot of genes, but we don't necessarily know what their function is. And people have done descriptive annotations, but you know, those descriptive annotations are usually pretty poor to really get a good handle on function. It's usually something like cell maintenance or, you know, if it's there's a, some strong effect of the gene, they know kind of what it is, but it, you know, breaking it out by space is a lot easier to say, well, okay, that's obviously involved in something in the head. You know, it's so it's, <laughs> it's still a lot, of, there are still a lot of problems with it, but it's, uh, it improves our Bradley? ability. Yeah. Yeah, I just emailed you and Susan two papers, uh, the titles of two papers. I might have copies of them by Wayne Broadland, uh, which does some discussion relating genes to axolotl development. All right. Okay. Now, Wayne is now retired and doesn't do any science anymore. Oh, okay. <laughs> All right. That sounds good. Oh, I thought you had put it in the chat. No, I didn't put it in the chat. Oh, okay. Sent by email. Oh, okay. Thank you. All right. So that's good. Um, 
let's see. Uh, Karan's here. I, I know you've had trouble connecting Karan. Did you have any comments or questions on that? You can type in the chat if you want. Are you there, Cron? Okay. So Oh, are you audible? I, yeah, I didn't hear anything. Your microphone, your, you were unmuted, but I didn't hear anything. Um, I just put something in the chat. That's the 4D chromosome organization. Okay. Um. Oh, 4D, yeah. Yeah, this is where we combine polymer physics, not theory, and high-performance computing. This is, uh, it looks nice. Soft Living Active and Adaptive Matter Seminar. So this is run out of, um, it's like you see Merced, because that's their Zoom link. But uh, yeah, it looks good. Yeah, thanks for that. APS Physics. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, maybe I'm going to write that. Yeah. All right, so why don't we move on to graph? Uh, now, now I have a little bit. Yeah, so, I can hear you now. Okay. So, yeah. Yeah, okay, okay. Yeah. Yeah, I, I, I only had bits and pieces, and the theme was freezing. I'm kind of facing some network issues. Okay, yeah. Uh, otherwise, what I overheard was uh, transforming the axolot limits to, a, to some sort of an atlas, if I'm not wrong, right? Yes. Or was it? Okay, okay. So, uh, he, like, is it specifically related to lay uh, just the construction based uh, constraints of the model or was it something else? Oh, well, yeah, so it was like if you built a model from microscopy and you had a, a bunch of cells, um, you would have to map that information onto the, okay. the cells. But we don't really have like cell pretty, specific. Pretty. Yeah, so these next generation uh, uh, methods Sometimes you can do like cell specific, okay. uh, you know, targeting, but you can't really, they don't really have that for axolotl. What they do have is tissue specific um, uh, measurements, but those tissues, you know, you have to figure out, uh, you know, where the tissues are, what, you know, if you say like there's a cell that's going to become a tissue or some region, you know that's that's a choice you make okay. but it's not necessarily it's not going to fit very easily so there are ways you can do these atlases so something okay like some sort of a cell differentiation tree you know that will form that big tissue and uh mapping those regions, something along those lines if I'm not wrong. uh yeah that like, might help I, if we had I like a that. yeah if we had a tree that would show us like kind of um you know, could sort of reconcile some of the data that exists for uh, genome, like, you know, this sort of spatial, yeah. Okay. And, like, for axolotl like, embryos also, like, this could, like, this this could be the added, added feature, you know, that maybe I was trying to find. Yeah. Like, uh, you know, we had discussed the, the ENCODE project as well. Yes. Uh, okay. Okay. I did, I think, zero in on some uh, key issues, you know, that could help me uh, improve the model uh, to, you know, because 3D reconstruction, doing it in like three minutes requires some special techniques, you know, like you need uh, camera parameters, you know, focal length, uh, distance from the object and uh, ISO format and all those things. The ones that are, you know, exist as you know practical uh solutions currently like they have open dome maps that are there which have a public license under open source you know 
that are available freely. So I'll have to, you know, see which which of these can be you know, applied properly. So I I think I'll 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 get in touch with Susan Murray and uh, to get some more uh, data. I'll I'll send a mail today. Uh, you know, regarding all those details, the CC. Uh, with, you know, whatever uh, research I've done so far. On that. Oh, that's, that'd be great, yeah. Yeah, I think that'd be helpful. Yeah. Oh, you are going to say something, Dick? Uh, yeah, I, ha I have a, a new project, though, that I need some expert image processing help on. Okay. <laughs> Having to do with diatoms. Oh, okay. Okay, you want me to do it now? Yeah, go ahead. Oh, okay, okay. Uh, let me share this. Let's see, uh, you can see me, so uh, I'm going to hold up a book. <laughs> yes. <laughs> That's the quickest way to find a picture. Okay, this is a an aberrant diatom. That means it's, it's screwed up in terms of its shape and morphogenesis. Uh, here's another one. Okay, and yeah. here's another one. They're all the same species. But I have about 100 uh, electron micrograms of them from Ryan Drum. These pictures are really old. They're at least 60 years old. <laughs> okay. Yeah. Uh, I've published three of them. And what I want you to look at is that there, there are two kinds of lines, a thick line and a thin line. Mm -hmm. Okay. And the idea is that perhaps the thin lines grow out from the thick lines. Okay. Yeah. The, uh, that's that's the basic idea. So the image processing question is: Can one isolate the thick lines? Yeah. Okay. <laughs> In other words, you have to you have to find all the lines, I guess, and find their width and put them and see if they form a bimodal class, and then isolate only those lines that are thick. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> which is obviously not a trivial image processing problem. <laughs> okay. okay. And the, the thick lines can be broken into a few parts. Yeah. Okay. So the idea is to use the thick lines as a start. If we can isolate them, use them as a start for a computer simulation and see if we can generate the thin lines, which we think grow out from them. Yeah. Okay. Uh, right. This this is a, this is an aberrant diatom. Uh, yes, aberrant. That means aberrant. What, what's it called? Uh, lick L I C M O R P H A, lickmorpha, or lickmorpha. Okay. I'm not sure what the pronunciation is. Okay, okay. So one could look up also normal ones of this type. Yeah. Okay. Okay. So, so you can see it's an it's an image. It starts with an image processing problem, and then it goes into a computer simulation, which might be done by uh, Beta Manikoff in uh, in Siberia. You know He's been doing simulations at molecular level. Yeah. Okay. 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 So that's the problem. As I said, there are about a hundred of them. So it's a, once a, once an algorithm works, it's it's a, a lot of processing. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> okay. Yeah. Okay. That sounds good. Yeah. And right, right drama uh, is the king of uh, diatom electron microscopy. He was yeah. the best in his day. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Uh, okay. So we have. Oh. Yeah. Right, Ryan is now a herbalist. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, so I'm sure he'd be very pleased to see this uh, old stuff of his published. But... <laughs> yeah, yeah, it'd be great. <laughs> okay, so that's the yeah. problem. Okay. Is it clear enough? Yeah, yeah. Okay, good. Hi, I also have some data that if anybody wants to work on it, it would be great. I have some uh, synchrotron data of... Uh, those axolotl eggs that I took several years ago and yes. I put it on into my computer and my computer crashes because it says it runs out of memory 
and I have 16 gigabytes of memory on my computer, so they need to be more of a sparse set. Mind you, I was going to try to give that to Dr. Sharif, my um, advisor, uh, for one of his students or something, but I mean, I'm just saying I have this data and Tom Portuguese worked on it already and got it into TIFF files for, for that matter um, as slices. Anyways. Are, are, are these projection data? Yeah. Um, so there's a possibility of doing computer tomography from them? Um, yeah. Okay. Uh, what else? Oh, a little piece of advice. If you go to your local computer store, you can pick up a multiple ter uh, terabyte disk for a couple of hundred dollars. Yeah, well, I, I have some. Um, and they've got this data on them. I've got the raw data and then I've got the stuff Tom did. And uh, okay. yeah, it's terabytes and terabytes and terabytes of data. Yes. <laughs> okay. Do you, have it, do you have it backed up in the cloud? No. No. Bradley, do you have storage that could handle it? Um, maybe, yeah. I mean, I have some external storage. I mean... Maybe for a backup, it would be a good idea to get, get a copy of Susan's data. Too. Yeah. Yeah, she sent me one already. Like, she sent me some on a, a disk. Yeah, so. yeah I, I, I'm, I'm talking about getting all of it. Yeah, so yeah, I know. It's, it's safe. Oh, okay. Well, I yeah, I can try to copy it over. That I'm, I'm not even sure how to copy it over. Because of its size? Okay, or? What are you doing? Because yeah. of its size. Okay. Yeah. I'll... I'll um, I'm working on the idea, but it hasn't. The easiest way might be to get an extra disk and put copy it to the to that disk and send the disk to Bradley. Yeah. 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 yeah probably. <laughs> I just don't know how to copy it to another disk because it's. We used to have an old saying when the days of computer tapes: the fastest data transmission was somebody walking across the room with a tape. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> That's sort of what's happening here. Anyways, I'm just putting this out there along with my my uh, mosaic salamander idea because nothing's happening with it and somebody should look at it. Okay. Yeah. Oh, uh, stupid question. In the synchrotron data, can you see the boundaries between cells? Um, I don't know if they're cells or if they're ruined cells. Oh, they have a oh. texture. That's all I'll say. It's a texture. Okay. Okay. You you know what stage they're at, so you know what visually they should look like. Yeah, they're around stage nine. Okay. Yeah. Okay. So so in other words, if 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 some segmentation algorithm worked, you could check versus check it versus the expected cell numbers at that stage. Yeah, you could. Yes. But you need to combine the data into a, a sphere and see if it actually looks like anything or if it's just oh, yeah. damaged. Yeah, yeah, but sometimes uh, sometimes algorithms can see things you can't buy. Out. So. Oh, yeah. And I have this, and I'm doing another couple of projects here because I'm trying to take a PhD in. So nothing's happening with it. So I'm just saying I have this. I have this stuff. Um, okay. Lots of it. I'm willing to share. Yeah. Okay, let me. And Harry Krishna, did you have the um, your movie that you wanted to show too? Or oh, okay. Yeah, yeah. I can just screen share it now. What I've done. Back in a second. Okay. So this is a movie from, uh, oh, this is something he made from the Axolotl data, or? No, I picked those images from the data. Okay. All right. I tried to map those images on this video. Then. Okay. Uh, I tried with photogrammetry, but uh, then I realized that uh, it might lose some data. Then. On the pictures, if I go with that, so I try directly mapping it on the screen. Okay. 
Oh wow, that's really nice. Yeah. That's nice. So you can rotate it with your cursor. Can you make it bigger? Oh, okay. There we go. <laughs> oh, these are mapped onto a, a virtual sphere. Yes. Okay. Great. So how was this made? This was made in something called Electron, it looks like. Right. You're muted, by the way. All right, Krishna. Sure. Yeah, that looks pretty good. So, yeah, that's a good... Uh, okay, so that's, that's from the source images there. And, uh, yeah, looks pretty good. So that's the, that's where you can turn it with your cursor. And, uh, yeah, it looks like, looks like it's pretty good. It, you know, there's some, yeah, look at there. It's, there's a little bit of, uh, like a zone where it's sort of stitched together, but that's good. I mean, that's probably, yeah. I don't know if you are able to unmute. Yeah, I don't know if that's. Yeah. That's the code. Yeah, there's the negative. Yeah, the images there. Very good. Yeah, that looks pretty good. Oh, yeah, thank you for that. that I didn't great. realize I was in your... Oh. <laughs> but that looks good. Yeah, I, I enjoy that. Uh, you know, I, I had mentioned, like, you know, one way to do this is to take the images and put them onto some sort of sphere um, and, you know, map, map them, kind of like warp them. Um, from the flat surface to some sort of spherical representation. And then, you know, something that you can manipulate in a browser. So that was made with this Electron program, correct? Yeah, Electron JS. Yes. Yes. Okay. Uh, electron what? Electron JS. Yes. Yes. JS means yeah, JavaScript. It's oh, a no. framework of JavaScript. JavaScript, okay. Yeah, that's why I used uh, 3 js Basically, it is a framework of JavaScript to manage 3D. Yeah. Yeah, very nice. Yeah. Yeah, it's very nice. That's good acting too. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. So, very first case is like to combine 10 images from the microscope to a map. Okay. Yeah, I have to figure out a way. Like, back up. Okay, uh, Harry Krishna, have you seen my old uh, paper on Google Embryo? Yeah, no, 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 I didn't. You did? Okay, uh, I'll, I'll send it, send me uh, your email and I'll, I'll reply with a copy of it. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, I'll put it in the chat. Okay. All right. Um. I'm going to share my screen here. All right, thank you. All right, so that's very good. Um, now I'd like to talk about uh, a couple things. I'd like to talk about graph neural networks and then go on to uh, a couple other items and then our paper of the, of the week. So this is something I posted in the... Um, in the Slack, the Openworm Slack, and the DivaWorm channel. This is Graph Neural Networks for Novice Math Fanatics. And this is something that 
um, is uh, created by Rishab Anand. So this was something that, uh, and you can see that there are a number of different, uh, like the, he's drawn out a lot of examples here. So this is a nice uh, thing that you can follow if you're interested. Um, so basically it just kind of goes over this distill article um, that he posted before. So distill, of course, is this uh, journal that has a lot of machine learning uh, articles on it and it has a lot of interactive articles. It's a very nice pl publishing platform. They've taken a break right now, but you know there are a number of different groups that are doing these uh, articles. So this actually, this article is a general introduction to graph neural networks and it just shows you like you know how these these embeddings are created and, and uh, work so you can touch these different layers and they show you how the properties of these different layers with respect to the graph embeddings at each layer so you can see that things propagate out like they would in a neural network but each layer has a graph associated with it so a graph embedding where the nodes are connected to one another in a non-random way. So I guess this has the same embedding at each layer. It's just processing it, kind of like a deep neural network, but it has these embeddings at each layer and it maps, say, like this cell maps to all the other cells, but not, you know, I don't know if it does it uh, evenly, but it's, yeah, this one only maps to these three over here. So you can see that there are different ways that they can be mapped between layers. And so this is, uh, this, this distill article goes into this. And then this article actually kind of dives deeper into that distill article and kind of goes through that a little bit more. And it kind of gives the background for it. So if you're kind of stuck on this graph neural networks concept, this is a good way to kind of get around those, those uh, uh, barriers. And so, you know, we're representing graphs. We basically use this adjacency matrix uh, and we have a, uh, it's a binary representation here where we want to know, you know, if we want to look at these nodes one through six, how are they connected together? So they can be connected to themselves or connected to any of their other neighbors. And so this adjacency matrix tells us what those connections look like. If it's an all to all connectivity, all of these values would be one. So everything would be one. Every cell would be connected to itself. Every cell would be connected to its neighbor or any other cell in the in the group. Um, you know, this is kind of like a Markov model where you have cells that are connected to themselves and then they're connected directionally to some neighbor. So three is connected to six, but of course six isn't connected, or actually I think six is connected to three. So this is a bi-directional graph, uh, but you can make them unidirectional. And so in that way, it's like a Markov model. And it, you know, the, the advantage of using a complex network, of course, is you get these parallel representations of different variables and that they're connected, you know, to different variables in different ways. So you're able to get these higher order uh, structures like cliques and uh, modules, which are just like local groups of cells that are connected to one another. And so um, that's, that's basically you build a graph. Then you have these uh, and of course, this, this type of graph is unweighted, so it's zeros and ones. But if you had a weighted graph, which you have in a lot of uh, um, neural networks, not on a graph, but on a, on a network of cells that are connected, you have this uh, decimal value between zero and one. So the weight would be like, you know, fuzzy in that way between zero and one, and then you'd have some sort of threshold where you'd say anything below 0 0.3 is not connected. And so that drops out a lot of connections and it gives you this kind of topology. So that's, you know, that's, that's the way you build graphs. And then this is what a complex graph looks like when you have a lot of nodes or cells and it has this sort of uh, uh, what they call a uh, hairball quality. So the hairball quality is where it has this sort of highly connected uh, uh, topology and it kind of looks like a hairball in a sink. It has this, you know, everything's masked up, and you can't really, you can't really say anything about causality, but you can say something about it's a pretty picture. Um, but you can analyze these, fortunately, so that you can get information out of them. And so, this is the image here. So this is an image. 
and then this is the graph that this image uh, you can you can create a graph to represent this image and so this is the kind of thing we want to do we want to take like images in our case uh, we want to take a subset of that image we want to segment the image in some way it doesn't have to be like uh, you know, traditional image segmentation. It's just segmenting the data in some way. It could be pixel by pixel. Uh, and then we want to build these graphs that are embeddings in, an, in a, a larger network or, or in a larger model. But we want to be able to take this image and turn it into graphs and say something about these graphs. So, um, you know, there's a lot more here in terms of like looking at edges and t explaining some of the details here, message passing, um, that ne won't necessarily be um, something that you'll need to worry about for your projects, but that's something we should talk about in the future. Um, there's this other thread about, uh, so this is the one I posted in the Slack on uh, graph theory and GNNs can be scary at first with so many architectures. So this is a maze analogy that's used here. And this kind of talks about the top six strategies for navigating a maze. And this talks about, you know, how how network how you navigate a network and there are alternate strategies for this navigation. And so it kind of goes through this, um, you know, kind of talks about how you would build uh, network embedding. So there, you know, you can go through this article and, and this is a nice set of visual uh, aids that, you know, it tells you how to go through the network. You know, and this is like going through a maze. There are different strategies you can use to explore that path, those paths. And so that's another nice uh, reference. Then there's this gentle introduction. Oh, this is the one I had open. So this is the one that I had for novice. So this is the one for novices um, by Rashav Anand. This one is the distill article. This one is the publishing published in towards okay, this is up towards data science. This is graph neural networks and this talks about message passing and physics inspired continuous learning models and graphs. So this is a very specific example of um, this sort of graph ML. Um, so they uses the example of message passing paradigms uh, where people are learning on graphs. So in the graph community, people use message passing as a way to study learning on graphs um, and so that's been a very uh, popular application and it's had a lot of impact um, and so you can actually look at GNNs in the same way you can use this t same technique uh, he argues that the node and edge centric mindset of current graph deep learning schemes imposes unsurmountable limitations that obstruct future progress in the field as an alternative I propose physics inspired continuous learning models so these are uh, just a different type of model for doing this, for looking at how these graphs work and their potential. It opened up a new trove of tools for the fields of differential geometry, algebraic topology, and differential equations. So far, largely not explored in graph ML. So if you're interested in the potential of this in other areas, this is something you want to read. I, I can put this in the Slack as well. Um, but it does go through some of these uh, basics here at the beginning. And so it uh, also talks about message passing and things like that. Again, those aren't things you need to know for the project, but those are useful things to know. And so again, the graphs, graph motifs now. So another, I mentioned cliques and I mentioned um, modules, but the basic unit of a graph is a motif. And so beyond like the nodes and the edges. So a motif is like where you have this relationship between X and Y. And you have like these little things like triangles or uh, zigzags or things like that, that you can identify again and again in a network. So you saw that hairball before. That hairball can be broken down into these motifs. It can also be broken down into other kinds of structures. But the motifs are very easy, interesting because they describe certain relationships. So very simple relationships like transcriptional networks, how gene X is affecting gene Y, or a neuron synaptic connection network, how neuron X is affecting neuron Y, or even a food web where uh, predator X is affecting, affecting prey Y. And so that, that kind of puts, uh, maybe not only allows you to find different patterns in the graph to see if you know these things repeat or if they're 
you know, in certain parts of the graph, but also allows you to figure maybe out, figure out causality. And so that's something that, again, you don't need to know for this project, but it's useful. Um, and then they have uh, these interpretable GNN models, which is where you have, uh, you know, you're looking, say, at the chemical structure of something. It gets put on a, a surface. So this is latent graph learning and then a message passing. So that's all I wanted to talk about, about uh, graph neural networks. Uh, I'm going to show you this abstract that was submitted. This is the abstract on hypergraphs. So this is the one that was finally submitted to uh, NetSci for this year. This is uh, hypergraphs demonstrated in anastomoses during divergent integration. So this is our hypergraph where you have the single cell and you get these different regions of the uh, embryo, these different cell types, and they form different subnetworks. And then there's their connections between these subnetworks shown in the graph. And so the idea is that these hypergraphs, each of these nodes have a subgraph within them. So those subgraphs then exchange members and thus you know, communicate in some way or they have some relationship functionally. And then you see that at each time step where you get more cells, you get like a cell doubling uh, in the embryo as, as at large. And then you get these uh, increases in these subnetworks, but you also get exchanges across subnetworks. So the embryo network is undifferentiated cells. Some of them get differentiated into neurons, like you see here. Some of these cells, you know, they get uh, distributed from a single undifferentiated network into a sort of like a generic network in a, in a connectome. You know, so you see that sort of, those sort of relationships. And uh, so that that's, you know, I, I'll, uh, I want to work in this into a full paper. So, Brandon, can I ask a question? Yeah. Is there any experimental work on what happens if you break one of those anastomoses? Um, I don't think so. Okay, a classical way of breaking tissues apart in embryos is to put a very thin sheet of mica between the cells. All right. Okay, so it's not impossible. <laughs> Yeah, yeah. <laughs> and that would be an interesting thing to see it would happen. Um, yeah. Yeah. So yeah, that that's that. Uh, I'd like to work this into a full paper. And if people are interested in working on it with me, that would be great. We could work on a, you know, maybe something where we implement something that is uh, more empirically relevant. So yeah. Um, also, I have found these things on my on the Synthetic Daisies blog. Uh, a couple of articles on soft materials I thought would be interesting. So there's this uh, merging electronics in biology, the future of touch. So this is a article on some of the things going on in haptic perception and in um, you know looking at like how we perceive things, how we touch them. And then um, looking at materials and their and their properties. So, like when we touch a surface, you know, we kind of take it for granted that it has a certain hardness. Um, now, when we touch a tabletop, for example, but if you've ever tried walking across ice, or if you've tried like you know um, walking on a slippery floor, or if you've tried walking on like a, a floor that's been rubberized, you know, you can tell that there are differences in those surfaces. And so the surface properties uh, affect how you touch things and how you perceive, uh, you know, your movements against those um, materials. So if you walk on something that's very soft versus very hard, you can tell if you're touching against something, pressing against something that's very hard versus very soft, you can also tell. And there are different consequences to that and like, you know, in, in terms of sensation and muscle uh, activation and things like that. Um, this this is actually then there like I used to do these posts where I would like go across a number of different topics. So this kind of gets into something called conformal electronics, which is a nice uh, way that they use compliant materials like you know pieces of plastic, but they embed electronics in them, and so they're able to fabricate these types of thin films that are able you know these uh, OLED displays that bend. I don't know if, how much they've penetrated the commercial market. This was, 
I think this post was from about 10 years ago. But, you know, some of them have penetrated the commercial market by now. And so, you know, it's like where you have this piece of plastic that bends, but you can also project things onto it. Like you can use it as an e-reader or, you know, uh, you could use it as some sort of computer display. So that's something that, you know, it's kind of has implications. I didn't mention in the in this post, but for people manipulating those displays as well. So um, then there's this other article, this is more biological. This one is on rats, cardiomyocytes, and jellyfish bodies. So this is uh, from a paper in Nature Biotechnology from 2012, a tissue engineered jellyfish with biomimetic propulsion. So this is a jellyfish that is actually, uh, it's, not a, it's not a jellyfish, it's a tissue engineered jellyfish. So they've made it from uh, muscle cells and it has a, uh, I think it has a pacemaker in it. And then it, it basically, it, it pulses so that it's able to propel itself through the water. They call it a medusoid. And the thing swims through the water column. And because they've been able to construct this thing, they kind of know what it's going to do. So it's this muscular pump that they've built. Um, they're building it in this, like, as kind of like a jellyfish. It's a bio-inspired device. It looks like a jellyfish, but they call it a medusoid. And so this is a stripped down version of the jellyfish morphology, uh, replicating only the components needed to approximate jellyfish swimming. So that's all that you need in this uh, jellyfish. And jellyfish aren't that complex, but they do have a, they do have what they call a nerve net. So they propagate signals throughout their body. This is something that is built on that principle but they only use the parts that they need to, to get the thing to move. And so uh, then they took these, uh, once these kinematics were understood, neonatal, uh, neonatal rat cardiomyocytes. So these are the cells, the precursor cells in, in the heart that contribute to formation of the heart muscle and things like that, uh, were allowed to self-assemble into the desired structure. So they're building these out of rat cardiomyocytes, but they, re re they resemble jellyfish. Cardiomyocytes will spontaneously contract in culture, which enables the cell population to approximate a nerve net. So this is what I told you about these nerve nets. And they're just basically where you have the nervous system distributed throughout the morphology. So you start, you know, at the edge and you go all the way across to the other edge. And then, you know, there's no real center to it. There's maybe a center, but it's not like our brains where everything goes up into that center to get processed. So you see that the jellyfish, uh, you know, moves by uh, creating thrust. It has a stroke where it kind of contracts and then it releases and it's able to push itself through the water. So it's able to do this power stroke and then a recovery stroke. And then it's, that's how the thing moves. And the idea is that you create a, 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 a scaffold of rat cardiomyocytes that differentiate into some sort of excitable muscle cell and they can do the same thing if they're on this, you know, they're not forming the heart anymore, they're forming this structure. And so you can see that there's this pacemaker system around the edges of the jellyfish. Uh, and you, you can do the same thing in a medusoid with rat cardiomyocyte, um, and you can stimulate it in a similar way. Then they show the stroke kinematics and what's happening. This engineered muscle behaves like the swimming muscle of a jellyfish and the fluid dynamics are similar. So, um, and then they also did, I guess they did a little bit more, this is a little bit more on the bioengineering. They were able to do some, uh, uh, they were able to do some uh, GFP on this to show some of the details of the muscle fibers here and the medusoid muscle and the jellyfish muscle. So the jellyfish muscle, medusoid muscle, I mean, you know, they're muscle fibers, but they just wanted to show the difference between them um, and, uh, you know, they just showed the kinematic performance of so the medusoid actually performs, uh, somewhat comparably with the jellyfish, although, you know, you have this angular velocity, it's not able to achieve high angular velocity, but it also doesn't fall off during the, um, recovery phase. So, you know, it, it does behave somewhat like jellyfish, um, and then there's some, like, goodies at the end here. Just kind of things. This is like you know, like putting it into some context. Um, yeah. So there, 
their cardiac pacemaker cells. Those are the cells that allow the muscle to keep beating. Um, and they're able, they've done a lot of simulation of these neurons. But there's also muscle that gets uh, that does a lot of the work. So that's what they're using in this model. But you also have cardiac pacemakers that drive the heart, uh, that coordinate the heartbeat and things like that. So yeah, there's some readings here. And I will put these in the Slack here. Let me see if I can find it here. Or actually, I'll put this in the chat. This one's probably the most interesting. So, uh, let's see. Oh, Nam Jyoti, uh, hello. How are you? We have a new member here. Um, and I imagine you want to find out more about our GSOC project. Projects. Can you introduce yourself or? Hi. <laughs> okay. Hello. <laughs> okay. Well, I'm going to go through one more paper before we go. And um, so we have this, have papers that we usually do. We have this, uh, I don't want to talk about soft collective matter since we've already been talking about this. And this is uh, something that I know Susan's interested in and we talk about a lot in this group. So we just talked about these cardiomyocytes and how, they're, uh, how they can be used to build, um, you know, different types of machines that resemble things in biology. So, and then we've also talked about how matter makes a difference in perception, in human perception, when it's touched and when it's interacted with. This is uh, going more in the direction of kind of like this biological engineering. So uh, this paper is uh, collective motion of cells modeled as ring polymers. And so in this, and I think Susan sent this to me or Dick, I can't remember who, but this is from the Soft Matter Journal. Um, so this is this paper. In this article, we use a coarse grain model of disjoint semi-flexible ring polymers to investigate computationally the spatiotemporal collective behavior of cell colonies. So this is where you have cell colonies that are um, distributed in a dish or in a scaffold, and they're behaving collectively. They're migrating collectively, or they're forming a, what they call a colony, which is where they have this defined structure from like just a bunch of cells dividing. A ring polymer in this model is self-propelled by a motility force along the cell's polarity. So there's this motility force that is uh, driving its movement, um, which depends on its historical kinetics, so where it's been in the past. Despite the repulsive interaction between the cells, a collective behavior sets in as a result of cells pushing against each other. So there's this uh, sort of, collective behavior that results from a simple rule, and that rule is that there's a repulsive interaction between cells. So they try to keep a certain distance from one another so that they can grow, and they don't want to get too tight together. Um, as a result, though, there's this collective behavior that where cells are pushing against one another because they have neighbors in all directions usually when they're in culture. Sometimes if a culture is growing, it's expanding outward. But still, you have cells in the, in the in interior of that mass that are, you know, having to, um, that are subject to some of these competitive forces of staying away from its neighbor. So this cooperative motion emerges as the amplitude of the motility force, as the amplitude of the motility force is increased, and where their aerial density is increased. The degree of collectivity characterized by the average cluster size the velocity field order parameter and polarity field pneumatic order parameter. So pneumatic, we talked about that. And they're using those different terms in ter you know, to try to measure uh, the orientation of the cells and what, you know, where they are in the culture. So they basically align with one another to, uh, that's the collective behavior. They align with one another locally. And then those, you see those as clusters in the culture. So then, uh, Furthermore, the degree of alignment exhibited by the cell velocity field within a cluster is found to be stronger than the exhibited by the cell than that exhibited by the cell polarity. 
comparison between the collective behavior of elongated cells and that of circular cells. So cells have different morphologies. Some are elongated along their uh, axis and some are circular, so they're just circles. And this gives you different behaviors and different collective behaviors. Um, so this comparison between collective behavior of those two types of cells at the same area of coverage and motility force, so they everything's equal in terms of their, repul their repulsion from one another and the area that they're covering in, in culture shows that the elongated cells exhibit a stronger collective behavior than circular cells. So the elongated cells are actually doing this more often than circular okay, cells. Guys. And this is in agreement with earlier studies. A quick question. What yeah. is the orientation of the cell polarity compared to the ring? Uh, I'm not sure. Let's see. Uh, so there are these... Let's see if we can find a figure. So this is uh, what they're doing here. It's a steady state the configuration. Polarity. Yeah. Is it the plane of the ring or is it perpendicular to the ring? Oh, uh, I'm not sure. This is, I think, just a regular, no. but I'm not sure. Yeah, I'm not sure. Yeah, yeah, the standard use of polarity in embryology is perpendicular to the ring. Okay, yeah. So I'm not like, sure they're using words the same way. They could mean the ratio between the uh, elliptic axes. Right, right. So you can see that you have these, uh, these are the cells, these are elongated cells. And then B is the, uh, let's see, uh, A is sort of the snapshot of cells. B is a snapshot of cell velocity. So these arrows are the cell velocities as they're moving against one another. And then C is the uh, snapshot of cell polarities of the same system shown in A. So these lines are like how they're oriented. If they're oriented, you know, uh, northeast, southwest, or north, south, or east, west, I'm just using directions to describe that. But you can see that there's like some uh, collective behavior there somewhere. There's a synchronization, and in other cases where it's misaligned relative to its neighbors. But you can see that you get these emergent structures where they're all kind of aligned in the same way in certain places. Um, and so this is just where the cells are on this um, on the surface. They're allowed to grow out, and then they show these polarity or these velocity uh, uh, arrow. Like they just show the arrow, and it shows the, the direction of movement. And I guess the uh, velocity field, which is also the length of movement. So I think these arrows are of different lengths a little bit. So that's that's what we have here. Um, and you can see that they form, and if, if you look at it, it just looks like they're forming random patterns. But the, there's a sorting that goes on as they're growing and, and kind of growing randomly that they start, start to form these clusters and they move against one another and then they form these colonies. So these colonies look like this. So the other article here is this, um, this is from, also from the Soft Matter Journal. And this is synchronized oscillations in swarms of nematode. So this is something again with nematodes, which we're familiar with the C. elegans. Well, this is a different species in order of, or uh, genus of nematode, uh, Turbatrix sisseti. So this is Turbatrix as the uh, genus and these are just synchronized oscillations in these swarms. So nematodes can form these collective balls of, of nematodes in certain environments. And if you look under a microscope, sometimes you can see them all sort of uh, uh, congealed in, into certain, these clusters. So it's kind of an interesting but, behavior yeah, that they have. Uh, when I was a kid uh, in Texas, I observed little balls of baby earthworms. Oh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah. Yeah, that's yeah, the, and they, it's, it looks very similar, I think, because <clears throat> they have these. They're just kind yeah. of like all yeah. <laughs> so there's been a recent surge of interest in the behavior of active particles <clears throat> that can both align their direction of movement and synchronize their oscillations, and those are called swarmulators. So that's interesting. I didn't know that. Well, theoretical and numerical models of such systems are now abundant. No real life examples have been shown to date. So this is uh, an example showing the collective motion of this nematode that's self-propelled by body undulations. So I don't know if 
some pe the newer people here have seen the C. elegans mode of um, movement, but they do this sort of sidewinding and it, or not sidewinding, but it kind of like going back and forth. Um, and it, you know, like they're swimming and that is body undulation. There are different ways that they can undulate their body. It's basically that they curve and they move forward and they have different modes of movement. If you want to see the different modes of movement, you can look it up. There are you know, different observations of this. Um, there's like a main mode and then there's like a swimming and, and liquid mode. So there are different ways that they move. We discover that these nematodes can synchronize their body oscillations, forming striking tra traveling metachronal waves. So I guess these are uh, time dependent waves, which produce strong fluid flows. So they have like a wake um, and they generate a flow. We uncover that the location and strength of this collective state can be controlled through the shape of a confining structure. In this case, the contact angle of a droplet. This opens a way for producing work, such as on-demand flows and displacement of objects. Um, the force generated by the state is sufficient to change the physics of evaporation of fluid droplets by counteracting the surface tension force. Uh, the relatively large size and ease of culture make this type of nematode and their swarmulators a promising model organism for investigating swarming and oscillating active matter. So this is, uh, let's see, so this is a, this uh, photos of evaporation of a 250 microliter droplet. So this is the evaporation of the droplet here. Uh, you have this uh, initial density of the so as this droplet is evaporating, these nematodes sort of congeal here in this ball, in this swarm. And um, then here's, here are the nematodes moving against one another in this, in this ball. There's synchronized movements here, so you can see that they're all kind of aligned. Um, and they form this metachronal wave. So you can see this metachronal wave under a microscope. Uh, they're all synchronized in time, so they have this they have these movements. Here's the undulating movement where they're kind of curved and they curve back and forth. So this part moves up and this part moves down and they, they undulate in that way. And they're all Bradley, synchronizing it. You know, yeah. I've got a question since you've worked with nematodes. Uh, is this behavior similar to what they do when they mate? Uh, no, it's not. It's <laughs> they not. have like, they, they, they get next to one another, but there's, they don't do this sort of thing. They kind of like, uh, they kind of go move against one another back and forth and they kind of uh, the, the males are the, there's a very small population of males that have a uh, they have like a spike on their tail and that's how they mate with the hermaphrodites and they you know but they have to move back and forth against one another actually in this way they don't do this kind of like organization where they're creating you know they're moving to get against one another like this where they're creating a wave it's just kind of like sliding uh, against one another. Okay. Kind of interesting, but uh, <laughs> nice. so yeah, this is and so you know nematodes can form a lot of these kind of collective behaviors. Um, they kind of examine this. They talk about drop the physics of droplet evaporation. So there's this biophysics surrounding this behavior, and this is of course something you'll see in the environment in uh, cases of. Uh, the environment, you know, when it's desiccating, um, but you also have this experimental model where they're allowing, they have the, the bunch of nematodes in a droplet because the nematodes are very small. They put the droplet down and then it evaporates. And then as there are a lot of nematodes in this droplet, you can suspend the nematodes in like a solution and put down a droplet and there's so many nematodes in it. Uh, and then as the droplet evaporates, they kind of come together and form this collective. So. Um, but then they explore this on hydrophobic and hydrophilic surfaces. So there's a surface tension that comes into play here. So when it's hydrophobic, it doesn't spread out as much as when it's hydrophilic. And so that has an effect on the collective as well. And so uh, force produced by nematodes, they go through that. You know, it's not a very big force, but there is a force. And especially collectively, you know, at this scale, at this size scale, they're creating a pretty decent sized force. And so they, they show the contact angle of the droplet and then the force of the nematodes against that. All right, so I think that's enough for today on that. So just to give you a sample of some of these papers in soft materials, 
Um, and let's see, okay, Hare Krishna, I believe, thank you for attending. And it looks like, um, yeah, that's, that's it. So do we have any questions? Okay. Yeah, quick question. Uh, pay attention to the oxygen availability versus crowding of the nematodes. Uh, it didn't look like it. I didn't see anything on it. Because that might be a factor. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, I'm going to go watch the um, 4D um, meeting. Okay. Sounds good. Yeah. <laughs> about half an hour, I guess, about that. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> Enjoy. All right. Thanks. Yeah. Well, thanks for attending, and if you have any questions, let me know, and uh, see you next week.